Just when you think things can't get any worse, it does. This economic war is escalating and the EU just made a terrible mistake. And it's one that threatens to wreck their economy and shift global trade flows. If you think the last two years were bad, 2024 is off to the races. To punish Russia further, the EU is messing with the very fabric of global trade itself. They are messing with China and India. In our lead story, EU agrees first sanctions on Chinese and Indian companies for Russia war links. For the first time in history, secondary sanctions are about to rain down on China and India. Secondary sanctions are punishments targeting specific companies. In this case, they are cutting away their access to EU markets. They can no longer deal with companies in the Eurozone. We must keep degrading Putin's war machine and keep the pressure high on the Kremlin. Von der Leyen isn't stopping and it's likely these sanctions will keep ramping up. There's a big risk with secondary sanctions. It can always expand in scope. It might be cutting away equipment, but it could always extend to oil and gas tomorrow. It's a really slippery slope. Companies importing Russian commodities could be targeted next. After all, it's still money flowing to the Kremlin. But consider this, Europe still buys energy, especially LNG from Russia. So they are contributing to the war machine as well. In the first three quarters of last year, the EU paid Russia 6.2 billion euros for LNG and another 6.3 billion for natural gas. Now sure, the volumes have gone significantly down, but 12 billion euros in nine months is still a big sum of money. Shouldn't these companies buying the LNG be sanctioned as well? But it goes beyond just their domestic use. When the EU buys Russian LNG, it flows into their terminals, into their ports. And all this excess gas doesn't stay in the union. They resell it away. During the same period, Russian LNG from Yamal flows into ports in Belgium, France, and Spain. Over 20% of these volumes get shipped away to countries outside of Europe, including China and Japan. Almost 4 billion cubic meters are resold to the global markets. And you best believe this is done with a markup on the original price. So Europe is making money by reselling Russian commodities as well. It's really bizarre to see the EU throwing around sanctions on China and India when they're kind of doing the same thing. Every country is acting in their best interest. You still need to trade with Russia and import commodities. Europe is no exception as well. While the EU reduced trade with Russia, we can see two commodities that have increased in volume. Comparing 2023 to 2021, LNG imports are up by 38%. But just look at uranium, it is up by an insane 86%. If this were to drop to zero tomorrow, energy prices in Europe would spike higher. It would just crush their industries further. And that's why secondary sanctions are just so dangerous. They set a precedent. If they spread to oil and gas and even wheat, just imagine the chaos it will cause. We'll see supply chains breaking, inflation will start soaring up again together with global interest rates. And here's another issue with sanctions. There's bound to be pushbacks from your target, especially from China. The EU economy isn't doing well. We all know this by now. I can throw at you a dozen charts to show the obvious. But let's focus on what companies themselves are doing. From Bloomberg, BASF sees growth in China while cutting European costs by 1 billion euros. The company is shifting focus towards China because of higher energy prices back home. Energy costs is still a big crisis. By cutting $1 billion from the German side, this is going to spill over into job losses as well. There's going to be a transfer of jobs from the West all the way to the East, and this isn't going to stop. So if you're a CEO, you have to move to where the money is, right? Margins are getting squeezed and a global recession is coming. By moving operations to China, they kind of see Asia as the next big driver of growth, not Europe. Now, if you think China is just going to sit back and take it lying down, then you have to think again. Listen to this statement from their foreign ministry. Chinese and Russian enterprises carried out normal exchanges and cooperation and do not target third parties, nor should they be interfered with or influenced by third parties as well. They have also vowed to protect the rights and interests of Chinese enterprises. And this is a warning to Europe not to cross the line. If Brussels really enforces these sanctions on the companies, China could very well hit back. So what can China do? They are aggressively moving towards manufacturing and that's an important fact we must understand. Loans to their manufacturing sector are flying to the moon from an average of 5% before 2020 to nearly 35% last year. That's a seven-fold increase that shows the shift away from real estate to manufacturing and this will grow China's manufacturing capacity even further, making it even more attractive for EU companies to relocate there. Whether it's microchips, chemicals or EVs, the destination of choice is going to be China 
Just imagine if China increases their subsidies for their local manufacturers. This will just make it impossible for Europe to compete. You either move your factories to Beijing or you manufacture back in Germany where costs are just so much higher. Denmark has already admitted that Europe can't compete when it comes to state subsidies. If they try to fight with the US and China on this, they will absolutely lose. They simply have no money for their industries except for Ukraine. But it goes beyond just cheap manufacturing. China has a huge domestic market for Europe to sell to. The future of China's growth will be fueled by domestic consumption. Over the last three years, local EV sales in China have exploded higher. The monthly registrations have gone from 200k a month to nearly 900k. That's over four times the growth. If China ramps up subsidies, more EU companies will leave Europe and just move over. The domestic market in China is just too big to ignore. And if Europe moves ahead with their sanctions, don't be surprised if all this escalates towards a full-blown trade war. All China needs to do is to ramp up subsidies and Europe will deindustrialize even further. And this is how dangerous things are becoming. But let's focus on another economic threat, one that is issued by Russia. And by now, we know the West is inching closer and closer towards Russia's frozen assets. And the end goal, of course, is to confiscate it. Using your opponent's money to fund a war against them, and on paper, it looks like a great idea. And every day, we have a new G7 country calling for confiscation. Rishi Sunak is demanding the West to go full steam ahead, to be bolder and to seize the frozen reserves. The end goal, of course, is to hit the Russian war economy to seize away hundreds of billions of dollars. And this is obviously a horrible decision that will blow back on the West, it will destroy trust in Western assets. But let's go beyond that. This move is going to force, it's going to spark a counter move, a retaliation from Russia. The Russian finance minister has issued a counter threat that Russia will give a symmetrical response to the West and there are no fewer frozen assets in Russia as well. In other words, if you take my stuff, I'll confiscate your stuff as well, the classic tit-for-tat strategy. So whatever Western investments or assets in Moscow will go kaput. And this is a serious threat. According to state media, the West has at least $280 billion worth of assets and investments locked away in Russia of which $220 billion belongs to EU countries. The UK also has $19 billion trapped as well. We could be moving to a future where Europe and Russia can never ever reconcile. The moment Europe presses the confiscation button, that's equivalent to dropping a financial nuke. It will literally split the world order into East versus West. It's important to understand the big motivation for this relentless push to confiscate Russian assets. It's the fear that aid from the US will never come, and Donald Trump returning. The big fear is Trump coming back and ending the war as promised. If the US goes behind Europe's back to negotiate with the Russians, then it's all over. Even Hillary Clinton is freaking out, saying that Trump will quit NATO, that Trump will simply stop funding NATO. Targeting the Russian assets is more of a financial hedge against Trump than anything. If the US stops it completely, at least there's still the $300 billion to fall back on. So just watch the lead up to the US elections. The closer Trump gets to a second term, the bigger the push will be for total confiscation. But something interesting is happening in the background as well. Russia is planning to take out loans in the Chinese Yuan. This is yet another de-dollarization push by Moscow. Even though the dollar is the most popular foreign currency to issue loans in, Russia would rather sell bonds denominated in Chinese currency. It's a less liquid market with currency risk, but Russia simply doesn't care at this point. A financial decoupling is already happening in front of us and it's only going to get worse. And let's cover our final story today. It highlights the desperation Ukraine is facing and how the war of financial attrition is being lost. Zelensky is demanding $60 billion within the next 30 days. US aid to Ukraine has to come soon to support troops on the battlefield, or it will deal a crippling blow. You might think that this is a desperate statement, but maybe it's a calculated one. If America throws in another $60 billion, it will reinforce the sunk cost fallacy it will be even harder to exit after throwing $160 billion into a black hole. And he's pushing hard on all the panic buttons. In the interview, Zelensky gave America the ultimate warning that millions will be taken out without US aid to Kiev. This is of course a shock and awe message. It's meant to paint a picture of doom and gloom to Congress. But he also made a curious admission during the conference. He told the world that Ukraine suffered a loss of only 31,000 soldiers. That is vastly lower than all the Russian estimates. Even the US puts the toll at 70,000 troops, more than twice its figure. So there's a lot of mixed messages coming. 
I think this tells us the impossible situation Zelensky is in. He can't admit that Ukraine is suffering terrible losses. It will send a signal of throwing good money after bad. But at the same time, he needs to keep scaring America into giving more money. And here's why. In a poll by the Pew Research Center, almost half of Republicans say that America is giving too much aid to Ukraine. The US is already $100 billion in the hole and another $60 billion is just unthinkable to them. But that's not all. The importance of the Russia-Ukraine war is starting to fall versus other conflicts. Americans are focusing more on the situation in the Middle East. In another poll, the Israel war is the more important conflict compared to Russia-Ukraine. Whether it's for US interests or their own personal lives, Americans are placing the Middle East as the priority. That, of course, is freaking Zelensky out. He needs the money to come before Donald Trump gets re-elected. If Trump is back, all bets are off. The $60 billion might never come. And this next chart tells us everything we need to know. The majority of Republicans don't see the value of US military aid to Ukraine. 70% of Trumpers find it not worth the cost. Even non-Trump supporters, 53% of them, see the aid as a bad deal. The biggest cheerleaders are of course the Democrats. Nearly 70% of them believe it's worth the cost. And once again, Ukraine's biggest nightmare isn't Putin, but the eventual return of Trump. So the closer we get to November, this craziness is just going to ramp up and the greater the chance of the West seizing away Russia's assets. But let's head back to the big story. If Europe continues to throw sanctions at India and China, this is just going to distort trade flows even further. The big risk is all these secondary sanctions hitting the oil industry, especially the refiners downstream. Despite the oil ban, Russia still made a billion euros from the eurozone last year. A large amount of refined oil from Russia is processed in India. These three refineries process at least 20 million barrels to the EU. They take in Russian oil, they refine it and export it out to the world, including Europe. And if sanctions spread towards oil refining, not only will India be pissed off, they'll be upset, but we can also expect fuel prices in Europe to rise as well. The Eurozone is playing a very dangerous game with secondary sanctions, and hopefully this is all talk and just posturing, because if it isn't, we better prepare for a world of high inflation once again. But let me know what you think. Did Europe really make a terrible mistake? And will Russia counter confiscate Western assets? Let me know in the comments below. Stay safe, be sure to smash the like button and subscribe as we navigate through these crazy times.